yeah. Glory, 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 guys. Oh, my goodness. That is awesome. That is awesome. And I always do such a fantastic job. I think Brent and I just worshiped our little hearts out. We, we did. I was thinking, you know, while we were doing that, uh, while we were worshiping and so forth, and, and how um, encouraging and enthusiastic the band is and how, you know, of course, I, I'm, I'm over here in a corner by myself like, like normal. And uh, I'm thinking, well, you know, there's, there, we're really in here pretty much by ourselves. And, um, but it doesn't matter because uh, it's not the people that you're worshiping for. It's, it's, the, it's the Lord who has his eyes on you. That's who you're worshiping and that's who you're presenting for and, and you're passionate for. And to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind and all your strength is the command uh, from the Lord to our hearts. And certainly that's... Uh, it's great to have an opportunity to see that and to be blessed by that. Uh, we are in uh, the last message of this series, actually. We've been in it for six weeks. It's a, it's a series called The Pretender. Of course, I, I understand that no one out there, and none of us have any uh, association with that being a pretender in life, but uh, you probably have some friends that do, so you can tell them all about it. But, you know, Lord can't bless our imitation of someone else. And the Lord has created us to do what he's called us to do. And he blesses what he's called us to do. And he strengthens us to do what he's called us to do. So we've been through a series of messages that have been trying to learn some lessons from the life of Jacob. And I think Jacob has been a very good dysfunctional guide for us through these five weeks. And I'm sure if you've been with us all five weeks that you are now understanding uh, that God can, if God can use Jacob, he can surely use you. And that all of us, every one of us are marred vessels. And we have to be put on the potter's wheel and we have to be reshaped so that God can work in us and do in us what he would have to do. Last week, we went back to Bethel. This is a place where Jacob had been before. We've been there with him. And this time, Jacob goes back and he, he completes his vow to God. He, made, he, got a, he got a promise from God the first time about blessing him and so forth. And he, and he made a covenant, really a contract with God. If you'll do this, then I'll do that. Well, now, 20, 20 years later, he's on his way back and he makes, and he, he completes the vow that he made. He builds an altar there and, uh, and, and, he, and he worships the Lord on that altar. And, and we learned from that, that uh, an altar is a place where where you take a good long look at what God has done in your life so that you can never forget where he has brought you and what he has brought you through. And it's really easy to forget that in life, uh, how God found you, what God has done in you, and the fact that God has blessed you in so many ways. I would tell you, look at your neighbor and say, I'm not so bad, but you'll have to have somebody there with you. Yeah, so... Compared to Jacob, you're not so bad, right? I felt that way this week. I said, hey, man, I'm not so bad. All right, let's go to Genesis 35, and let's see this last little incident in the life of Jacob. I think it'll speak to you, really. I think it will be a very impactful word for our hearts today. And, and in verse 16, Genesis 35, then they journeyed from Bethel. And when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, and that's gonna be identified, that's the town of Bethlehem, Ephrath. Rachel labored in childbirth. And you remember beautiful Rachel that he worked 14 years for. He loved her and she was the love of his life and she had been barren for so many years and finally had one son named Joseph. Now here she is about to have her second child and she, was, she labored in childbirth and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, do not fear, you'll have, the, you'll have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel moved on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Adar. So we've been journeying with Jacob and this family caravan, and we have now been to Bethel twice, 
the first time Jacob was on his way to, to go to Uncle Laban because he had bought the birthright and he had stolen the blessing. And Esau said, I'm gonna kill you. And so his mom suggests to go visit her brother Laban and Jacob is running from Esau on his way to Laban's house the first time. So he runs into Bethel the first time. He's, he's running fast, he's talking fast, he's making deals, he's uh, doing what Jacob always did. This time he comes into Bethel and he's limping. He's, he's, a, he's a crippled man making his way back to a place where God had visited him before so that God can again speak to him and so that he can complete his vow that he made to the Lord um, to build an altar and to worship him and for him to be his God. So I think that you, you can understand that your life is moving forward when you're no longer making deals with God, but you are building altars. Because the altar is a place of sacrifice, uh, where you die to yourself, where the Apostle Paul in Romans 12 says that we are to make ourselves a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable to the Lord, uh, which is our reasonable our mature, our, 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 our understandable service. And so here's Jacob building an altar. And, and at the altar, you pray things like, uh, not my will, but yours be done. Uh, I think Carrie Underwood had a famous song years ago called Jesus Take the Wheel. That's the attitude really of, of the altar where you die to yourself. And this is what Jacob did at Bethel the second time through. So I think that there's an expectation from everyone involved from Jacob and everybody in Israel at that time, there's this great expectation that uh, when Jacob returns to Bethel and Jacob uh, honors his vow that he made to God, that God will bless him. Now, I don't want to get too sidetracked on this at the moment, but isn't, isn't that where we all live, really? I mean, if I ask you in the depths of your heart, and I'm not you know, I'm not trying to make anybody feel awkward. I'm just saying that this is humanity. This is the way humans think about things. It, I mean, it, isn't there or wasn't there an expectation in you that when you gave Christ your heart and you became a child of God, that somehow when you really needed it, that because you did right by God, that God is gonna somehow bless you at the appropriate time? Because actually, you know, healthy relationships are reciprocal, right? I mean, if, you, if you have a friend and your friend does something nice for you, well, what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna try to do something nice for them, right? You're gonna reciprocate. Or if they do you a favor, then you're gonna be looking to do a favor to them. And so uh, you would expect God to bless Jacob because when you do something for God, then of course you expect God to do something for you when, when the times get hard. Well, it's time for God to do something good for Jacob. Verse 16 said, and when there was a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth. All right, God, it's your time to do something good here. This is where we need a blessing because Rachel, remember, Rachel is the one that Jacob loves. Rachel is the one who, as a matter of fact, she's probably the only person besides himself in the world that he loves. And she's having childbirth. All right, so come on, God. I did what I was supposed to. I kept my vow. Now, come on and bless us. And, and, and of course, we're all happy for Rachel because she suffered so much. I mean, she, the only crime I submit that Rachel ever committed was being born beautiful. And that wasn't her decision. That was God's decision, how her genetics would line up, and that she would actually be beautiful. It's Jacob who was so surface level that, of course, he only loves what he could see, and he didn't value Leah or anyone else. But Rachel, you know, God shut her womb up, and she didn't have a child, and Leah had six boys before she even had one. And then her maid, who was given to her to serve her, had two children, and then... And then Leah's maid had two children before Rachel had Joseph and she finally has a son. God sees her and has pity on her and goes, oh, 
maybe I, maybe I was a little harsh. Let me open up her womb. And she has one son and they name him Joseph, which literally means may he add. So it's obvious that she wants more children and that she wants to give more children to her husband that she loves. And Jacob goes to Bethel, he makes a sacrifice, and now it seems like God is rewarding him by allowing the love of his life, beautiful Rachel, to have another child. In verse 16 says, and she had hard labor. Well, what's up with that? She had hard labor. This is when God is supposed to do something, that, do some God stuff. Come on, God, rescue this situation. This just doesn't seem right. What's up with that? Well, if you've ever considered being used by God, or if you've ever considered your life as a life that God would use or could use, which let me let you in on a little secret, all our lives are lives that God would use and could use and he, and he does use. So if your life is a life that God can use, what are some considerations that, that you would have to make when you pray for God to use you? Now, back especially in my younger years, and I know some of you guys that are watching me right now from especially the Meridian area and maybe even some that have been spread other places, um, I used to do a lot of revivals and I like most young preachers, passionate, full of fire, and, you know, just, just all over everything. Idealistic, optimistic, uh, can do, conquer the world, whip the devil, you know, just all of that passion. And we would pray all the time out loud. I mean, like I would be up here in a service and there'd be people sitting out there and, and I'd be praying, God, use me. God, use me. God, use me. And then I'd invite people to the altar and they might be sitting down here at the altar saying, God, use me. God, use me. God, use me. You remember that, don't you, son? Yeah, we, man, we would have, we had, at, at Russell, we had over 50 youth. And man, the whole altar would be full of just youth and praying, God, use me. I mean, we were, we were all fired up and passionate about God using us. Well, in this incident, I think we see some things that we should consider as we pray for God to use us. No matter whether we're young or old, th these are some things that happen when God uses you. Consideration number one. Sometimes God will give us what we pray for, but when he does, it will cost us a price that we never imagined. God used me, and he indeed might use you. But when he does, it's gonna cost you a price that you never imagined when you were praying for God to use you. Rachel prayed for a son but she didn't know what we know. And that is that God was going to indeed answer with yes, but in the process, she would lose her life. Now, I'm not telling you not to pray for God to use you. I'm just saying that he may indeed do so, but if he does, it may require that you be broken and spilled out and poured out in ways that you might not have imagined or you might not have seen coming when you first ask him to pray, uh, to use you. Now, I feel sure that everyone in this caravan, that everybody in the camp of Israel, what, they were just excited as they could be about the fact that Rachel was about to birth a child. I mean, I'm sure that she was kind of like the home team underdog of the whole group, you know, it just seems like God had shut her out. And, and it, I mean, she, she was nice and she was 
pretty and she was sociable and she was everything, but she wanted so desperately to have a child, but somehow it just wouldn't happen. And so now it is, and she's about to have a child and everybody's probably shouting and hooping and hollering, ain't God good all the time. Yes, he is. He's wonderful. God blesses us with all abundant things. I mean, you can imagine them. They're waving the banners and tooting the horns and they're all fired up about the fact that Rachel, beautiful Rachel, is going to have finally be able uh, to have the desire of her heart fulfilled. But somewhere in the process, something happens. And Rachel goes into distress. And there's not an emergency room to fill in, uh, pull into. And there's not any special medical procedures that, that can be done on the trail back then. And Rachel dies as her son is being born. Never saw that coming. Never would have imagined that. Which brings us to consideration number two. Quite often in our lives, one thing is dying while something else is coming alive. We, we have these little colloquialisms and expressions that we use to express our feelings quickly, just little lines like, it's all good. It's, a, it, it's all good. Well, it's fine to use that little phrase, it's all good, as long as you understand that that's never true. It's never all good, ever, for anyone, at any time in life. Remember, good and bad run on parallel tracks and they usually arrive at the same time. Yeah, our life is, is a mixture of good and evil and that the mystery of good and evil is the mixture of good and evil on this earth happening at the same time. So if you're waiting on things to be all good, I just want you to know that you're gonna be waiting forever because it's never all good. Sometimes it's good at work, but home's falling apart. Sometimes at home it's wonderful, but man, there's so much strife and tension and stuff on my job. I mean, it's, it, it's never all good. So the reason I'm saying this is because I, I, I believe, and I can't see out there behind the cameras, but I can see the several that are here with me. Of course, they're the sanctified souls of God. And, and they never go through anything like this, but so you can know. I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm speaking today to someone who has something dying in your life while at the same time something's being born. Uh, maybe triumph is dying in your life and trouble's being born, or maybe sadness is dying in your life and joy is being born. Along this way that we travel, God does not promise us that it will all be good. In Romans 8, 28, one of our favorite, favorite verses that almost any Christian can quote, it says, Paul says, for we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. So if you try to wait until it's all good to praise God, you're never gonna praise God. If you have to wait till it's all good to be happy or to celebrate victories or to have peace in your heart or to enjoy what God has given you, you never will because there's always something that is being birthed while something else is dying. As a pastor of church all these years, 50 years of life almost, uh, 50 years of pastor almost, my life has always been filled with, with some people going while others are coming. Something's always dying so that something else can be born and I'm just telling you that God knows how to superintend our life. God knows how to, uh, uh, to prune our life. You, you know, Jesus said in John 15 that, uh, that, uh, that he's the true vine and that his father is the vine dresser. 
His father is the, is the caretaker of the vineyard. And the caretaker of the vineyard sometimes lifts vines up and sometimes he cuts vines off and sometimes he takes something out so that something else can produce more. God just knows how to do all of that kind of stuff. So in verse 17, uh, Genesis 35, now it came to pass when she had hard labor that the midwife said to her, hey, Rachel, don't, don't, don't fear, don't, don't be in despair because you're gonna have this son. This is gonna, this is gonna work. Look, the, the, the midwife, you know, and sometimes God uses other people in our life to point out things that we can't see ourselves. Because we can get so fearful and we can get so overcome with anxiety that we can't see God doing anything in our life. But the midwife says, here, you know what the important thing is? This son's gonna be born. That's what the important thing is. And so don't be filled with despair. God, this son is gonna be born also. Uh, and that gives her a little bit of perspective in verse 18. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died. In other words, she was breathing her last breath. And there's something that's always breathing its last breath while something else is breathing, breathing its first breath. So here's Rachel breathing her last breath. And in her last breath, here she says that she called his name Benoni. Call his name Benoni. And she dies. And Jacob says, call him Benjamin. Consideration number three. Great strength is often born from great sorrow. Boy, that's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? Great strength is born I'm, going to say, I, I'm not going to be dogmatic to, to say all the time, but I'm going to say in far more times than not, great strength is born out of great sorrow. Call his name Benoni, but his father said, call him Benjamin. So let's talk about naming rights for just a second. Names today are in their own special league, Right? Now, I, I don't want to say too much because I don't want to, I don't want to overdo this and, and offend somebody with this. But, you know, as a, would I say mostly retired person? Uh, minimally uh, retired person. <laughs> I would, uh, I do drive a bus <clears throat> for Harrison County School District and I carry, I have 60, 69, if you want to know how worried parents are about their kids catching COVID this year, I have 69 elementary school kids on my bus every day. 69. I had 18 last year, if it gives you any comparison. And I have teenagers too. I do for the high school, 44 high schoolers. Get out of the house, get to the school, get on the bus. But because of that, I run into names, lots of names. And I've just, you know, talking about naming rights, I just put a few. Dan, do you have, put the, put the first one. All right, what is that name? See, they're not always named something, you know, that's kind of unique. Uh, sometimes it's just spelled in a unique way. Uh, to, to be different, really. All right, what would that be? David, all right, put the next one up. All right, this one. Angel, all right, next one. Corbin, that's Corbin. I actually have a fourth grade on my bus spells just like that. Next one. Grace. Next one. Oh, that's one of ours. Just to show you that everybody's touched with it. This is Amy, by the way. Some people look at that and call and say, ah, me, which it looks like, you know, but it just shows you, I mean, even uh, Amy's uh, 39 years old. Sorry, Amy, she's 30 or 40. 40 years old, ooh, sorry. Amy's 40 years old, but see, we wanted to name her Amy, which is a common name, but we wanted to spell it in a unique way so that she could be distinct, is what I'm saying to you. And I'm sad to say that some of these children with some of these names that their creative parents have, have put on them, they're gonna have to be in the sixth grade before they can even spell it, I'll guarantee you. It's just some very unique names. But the most unique one that I've seen is this next one. And see if you can tell what this name is. Uh, is it like La-Ah? 
are la, Allah. Well, if you would be guessing that, you would be wrong. The name is Ladasha. I'm not kidding you. I'm serious. It's Ladasha. And can we all agree that Ladasha's parents are probably not going to go to heaven when they die? Can we all agree with that? And that they should not be allowed to procreate and fill the earth. Yeah. But, but names, you know, they're just <clears throat> so unique, unique. So Rachel, with her last breath, says, name my son Benoni. Now, Ben means son. And Oni is a little bit more complicated. Uh, Oni can mean, it has a dual meaning. It, it means, on one hand, it means strength or vigor. And on the other hand, it means sorrow. So based on the context here where Rachel is dying and she says, name my son Benoni, I think we could conclude that she most likely intends for the name to mean sorrow. This is the son of my sorrow. So Rachel is breathing her last breath and she names her child Benoni, son of my sorrow. Now, we can certainly understand this. I mean, this is completely understandable because although God had answered her prayer and given her a son, she's not gonna be there to hold him and to nurse him and to comfort him and to cheer for him. I mean, she's in the final moments of her life and in the final moments of her life, she knows that even though God gave her what she wanted in life, that she wasn't even going to be there to experience it. And so she names her son out of the pain that she is experiencing when she produces him. And what a name it is. Uh, it can mean sorrow, uh, which it probably does here, but it can also mean strength. I mean, isn't that interesting? That a name, one name can mean both sorrow and strength. Now, I can hear you thinking, and it takes a long time to get it over the internet, but I can hear you thinking, and uh, I know you're, you're probably sitting there going, how can the same word have such diametrically opposed viewpoints? Well, I'm just gonna point out to you that we have all kinds of words in the English language like this, and we create new ones every day, like the word bad. Bad can mean terrible, or bad can mean, you know, great. You're a bad person. Or, man, you're bad. It just depends on the context and the inflection and the way that you use the word. Well, that's the way this word is. It can mean sorrow or it can mean strength. But let's think about just for a moment. Let, let's just consider the fact that, that uh, the concepts of strength and sorrow might not be as mutually exclusive as we might think. I mean, what if... What if, what if great strength uh, is born out of great sorrow? I mean, maybe great strength is, is only born out of great sorrow. Maybe, maybe the people that are the strongest people that you've ever met are the ones that have endured the greatest sorrows. Or, 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 or maybe the greatest trials in life are the ones that create the greatest strength in your life. You, you remember the point from a couple of weeks ago, the, the thing that God puts in our life is the very thing that we're always trying to throw off of our life and he put that in our life in order to bless us. And we try to throw it off because we consider it a, a, a weakness. We don't want it, we try to get rid of it. And God said, I put that there so that you could be strong. Quit trying to throw it away. I mean, look at Jesus. Nobody on earth has ever been stronger than Jesus. But when Isaiah the prophet describes Jesus, you know what Isaiah says about Jesus? That he is a man of sorrow and he is acquainted with grief. 
And I will guarantee you that if you ever met someone that is really strong in life, you can bet on it that somehow, some way, something has happened that has caused them great sorrow. Now, I hope that, that helps some of you today if you're facing great sorrow in life. To know that, you don't have to accept it as sorrow. Now, I'm not talking about some spooky name and claim it stuff here. So don't think I'm trying to, you know, be one of these cloud guys. But I'm telling you that you don't have to receive an event, a happening, uh, a thing in your life as great sorrow. You have the right to rename that thing because your great sorrow today can become your great strength tomorrow. And the, and the tears that you're crying today can be watering the seeds of the greatest assets in your life tomorrow that you've ever seen in life. Because in this life, something is always dying while something else is being born. Consideration number four. The last one, by the way. Somebody asked me one time, what does it mean when preachers say, and finally? I said nothing. It means absolutely, it means absolutely nothing. Here it is, finally. Consideration number four. This is a good one. I love this. You don't get to choose everything that comes into your life. We all know this, right? We don't get to choose everything that comes into our life. But as a child of God, you do get to choose what you call it. To me, that's, a, that's profound. You, you, you don't get to choose what comes in your life, but as a child of God, exclusively as a child of God, God does give you the right to call it what you want. Verse 18, as she dies, she said, name him Benoni, and his father called him Benjamin. Now, that's kind of rude, in my opinion. When I, read, when I read that, every time I read it, I'm thinking, man, Jacob, he just don't, you, you, you just don't have, the, uh, you don't have the, 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 the gauge. You just don't have the, uh, what word am I you, you're looking for? Uh, we're all born with, with uh, certain meters in our life. And because we're Southern people, we're born uh, with uh, and taught that uh, we're not supposed to be rude. You know, we're supposed to honor things. I mean, this was the last word of his dying wife that, that, he, that he loved more than anything. And she said, name our son Benoni. And he said, nope, gonna name him Benjamin. I'm thinking, come on. And you know, you know Jacob loves her because like I'm, I've mentioned a couple times, she's the only thing he's ever loved except for himself. The Bible doesn't even tell us that Jacob loved God. But it does tell us that Jacob worked seven years and then got tricked into Leah and then he worked seven more years before he got Rachel. That's a long time, by the way. That's a lot of hard work out in the hot sun and in the Mideast. But the Bible says that even though it was 14 years, that it seemed as, as, as but a few days because of his great love for her. Only person in the Bible that the Bible says Jacob loved was her. So you know, you know he's hurting. You know he feels sorrow. You know he feels just like she feels, that this is the most discouraging, depressing thing of all time. The one I love, my beautiful Rachel, died having our son. Certainly, this is a son of sorrow. It surely is. But Jacob refused to name the child that was born in sorrow according to the sorrow that accompanied his birth. In Jacob's culture, only the father had the right to name children. Now, the mother could make suggestions, but the father had to sign off on it. So this is just, just a thought that might, have, might help some of somebody that's been labeled by their past. 
that it's only our heavenly father who has the naming rights to name us because the one that created us has the right to name us. And somebody might call us klutz and he calls us beloved. Somebody might call us crazy and he calls us creative. I mean, God names us and he has the right to name us. So don't let somebody, don't let a name that's carried from your past become an identity for who you are now. Benjamin, Benjamin, Benjamin. Call him, no, we're not calling him Benoni. We're gonna call him Benjamin. Well, you know what Benjamin means? I know with these cell phones, you could look it up in a second, but just hang on. I'm gonna tell you in just a second. I'm on my way to telling you. Jacob has lots of experiences with names. It seems to be one of the, one of the, uh, the constant major themes of his life. Because you know, Jacob was renamed himself, right? God renamed Jacob. He was Jacob. First time he went to Bethel, he was named Jacob, and then he wrestled with Jesus at, the, uh, uh, at, at Jabbok, and God said, your name's no longer Jacob, but we're gonna call you Israel, Jacob means heel grabber, and Israel means triumphant with God. And you know, he's still kind of both, both of those things, really, actually. He's still kind of both. But he also not only got renamed himself, he also renamed some places as he went along. Bethel wasn't called Bethel when Jacob went there the first time. You remember what it was called? Luz. Its name was Luz. Loserville. Jacob said, no, 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 no. This is no longer going to be called Loserville. This is going to be called the house of God, Bethel, or the gates of heaven. Because any place that God shows up, the presence of God makes it a heaven, even if it's a Loserville. So Jacob said, we're going to rename this place. We're going to call it, we're going to call it the gate of heaven and the house of God. And then in Genesis 32, I think I put it up, up there for us, Dan. First verses one and two, look at, this is another place. So Jacob went on his way. Now, that's talking about he's coming back. He left Uncle Laban's and now he's on his way back. So that's what these verses are talking about. So Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim, which means two camps. One count for God, one count for me. And then there's that pivotal point where God, where Jacob wrestles with Jesus at Jabbok and as he limp, you know, God knocked his hip out of joint and he blessed him and so forth with, with his strength. And so Jacob left there with the strength of an angel and the limp of a crippled man. But when he was walking away, Jacob renamed that place. It's no longer Jabbok. It was, what did he name it? Peniel, right? Peniel means I've seen the face of God and I've lived to tell about it. So Jacob had renamed some places and God had renamed him himself. Now, at the most soulful moment of his life, the most painful, emotionally painful moment of his life, he thinks, if I can rename some places and God can rename me, then maybe I can rename this too. So, he said, call him Benjamin. Okay, so what does Benjamin mean? Well, Ben still means son, but when you put Jamin on it, it means son of, because well, you see Jacob is looking at tragedy. He's looking at loss. He's looking at pain. He's looking at hurt. And, and he says, I'm not gonna call it tragedy. I'm not gonna call it pain, hurt. I think I'm gonna call it Benjamin, son of my... Remember, when Jacob went in to get the blessing that belonged to Esau, you remember that he went into Isaac, his father, and Isaac, his father, was so old that he couldn't see anymore. He was blind. And so Jacob was able to trick Jacob and Rebekah, his mama, were able to trick old blind Isaac into thinking that he was Esau. And then Isaac took his right hand and, and, and that's the hand of blessing. That, that's, that's the hand that is identified as being 
reserved for the transference of the blessing to the firstborn. Now, if you're left-handed, I'm not trying to crush your spirit, but that's just the way it is in the scripture. The right hand was called the hand of power, the hand of strength, the hand of authority, and it was the hand of blessing. So in the scripture, Isaac takes his right hand and he puts it on Jacob and the transference of the blessing took place. So when Jacob names his boy Benjamin, here's what he said. You are the son of my right hand. We're not going to call you sorrow. We're not going to call you tragedy. We're not going to call you loss so that every time I call your name, I'm reminded of the loss and the hurt and the defeat and the pain that I felt here. We're going to call you son of my right hand, son of anointing, son of blessing, son of strength. So all of his life, Jacob has been trying to get the blessing and here at the, at, the, at the situation that other people would call a curse, your wife, the one you love, dying while your son is being born, how tragic is that? So at the very moment of the worst possible event that happened in his life, that everybody that saw it would say, that's not a blessing, Jacob, that's a curse. Jacob says, hold on a second. I have a right hand too, and it's time for me to use it. I'm choosing to call it a blessing in my life. Call him Benjamin, the son of my right hand. He's not gonna be a curse, he's gonna be a blessing in life. I, I, I'm just saying, don't call that boy loser. Don't call that boy pain. Call him blessing, call him triumph. Call it, call it what you want. Now, where did Jacob learn something like that? Well, isn't that what God did with Adam? When Adam was created on this earth, all the animals were already here, but they didn't have any names. And so when Adam was created, God told Adam, all right, I'm gonna bring all these animals before you, and they don't have any names, and, I, and I'm gonna give you naming rights, and whatever you call them, that's going to be their name. And Adam started calling all the animals by name. Now, Adam didn't create the animals, but God gave him the right to name the animals. I mean, you don't get to choose everything that happens in your life. I mean, Adam didn't get to choose how the animals were made. He didn't, he didn't get to decide how many there were, what they looked like, what they were made from. Just like we don't get to choose all the situations that come into our life, but Adam did get to, to choose what he called it. And as a child of God, we get to choose what we call those situations. I mean, isn't it time for we as child, children of God to take, to take that, that authority that God has given us, that, that, that right hand, that, that, that hand of power, and, and, and call some of these terrible events and tragedies and issues that happen in our life something other than the tragedy and the horror that they are? I mean, God says, I'm gonna give you the authority. Here's the way most people live. Here's the way most people live. Well, and I've heard this thousands of times, thousands of times. Well, pastor, I just tell it like it is. They're bragging. I just tell it like it is. And what, I know what they're saying. They're saying, you know, hey, let's keep it real. I mean, let's don't, let's don't try to make it too uh, contextual here. Let's just, I just I tell you, I tell it like it is. Well, I don't want to be um, hurtful about it, but I'm just going to tell you that it doesn't take any faith to tell it like it is. Anybody can tell it like it is, right? Anybody can look at a depressing situation and say, this is so depressing, or a discouraging situation and say, this is so discouraging. And it might be, it well might be. I mean, it's, it, it's painful, it's depressing to lose your father to a stroke. It, it's, it's, it's discouraging to lose your mother to an an embolism 
or a friend of Alzheimer's. It's terrible to lose your children to drugs and it's frustrating when everybody else seems to be able to get a good job, but you can't get a good job. So you can call it what it is, but if you call it what it is, that is what it will always be to you. Rachel wasn't wrong. It was son of my sorrows. She was telling the truth. That's what it was. But Jacob says, that's what it was, son of sorrows. I choose to see strength in that. So I'm not calling it what it was anymore. I'm going to call it what God says it is and what it can be with him because I have naming rights. I'm going to call it what I want. I can call it peace. I can call it joy. I can call it provision. I can call it strength. Call it what you want. Sometimes you can change the situation. And if you can change the situation, do it. But when Rachel died, and, and he had sorrow in, in his heart, he couldn't bring her back, but he could change that name so that it speaks of faith and not defeat, of potential and not loss. Because we know many times out of great sorrow comes great strength. Many times something's dying while something else is being born alive. Good and bad run on parallel tracks and they usually arrive at the same time. But if I name it sorrow and pity, I'm going to get stuck in the muck and the mire and that's all it'll ever be to me. And I'll never see any other thing in it at all. Tell it like it is. No, tell it like God says it is. And he gives us that right. And so Jacob in this last moment of life, Rachel says, name him son of my sorrow. Nope, I'm naming him son of my strength. Oh, one, one more thing. Uh, then we're gonna let Jacob go away for a while. Bless his heart, we've been beating on him for th six weeks now. Verse 20, and Jacob set up a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. So Jacob doesn't deny the loss. He's not delusional. He knows that his life's never going to be the same again. He buries his past. He buries Rachel. And Jacob set up a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. And Israel moved on and pitched his tent toward the Tower of Eder. So Jacob buries Rachel and Israel moves on. Jacob set up a pillar, but it was Israel that moved on. Israel's Jacob's new name, right? That's the name God gave him when he changed him at Jabbok. So that's you. Israel is the new you. That's the part of you that abuse couldn't destroy, that neglect couldn't negate in your life. This is the part of you that hard times couldn't break. This is the part of you that the devil couldn't steal and people couldn't, couldn't take away. This is the new you, Israel moved on. I'm just saying it's time for, for us as children of God to move on. I mean, come on, we, we, have, we, have, we, have 12, well, we have 12 boys now, Simeon, Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, Dan, uh, Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali, Gad, and Reuben. We got all the boys and we got to move on. It's time to move on. So, I'm going to stop focusing on what I lost and I'm going to start focusing on what I have left. left. And uh, this, this, I think you, didn't you do this Philippians 2 in, in one of the praise and worship we did at the start of the service? If we didn't, I heard it, but let me read it to you. God must have sung it to me if y'all didn't do it. Philippians 2, 8 and 9. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And here's what I want you to hear. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on the earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I, I want to read that because I don't know what your situation is named, 
But I do know that whatever your situation is named, there's a name that's above that name. That name is Jesus, the name which is above the name of every other thing on this earth. And he challenges us to receive from him in ways that we don't often see coming. It's like I said a few weeks ago, I don't say many things profound, uh, but a few weeks ago, I made the comment about the reason we don't recognize our prayers when they come back to us is because we always pray for an answer that doesn't have a limp in it. So when it comes back limping, we don't see that as God answering our prayer. If it came back riding a white stallion with power and strength and a sword in its hand, that's God. But we don't ever see limping as God's answer to anything in life. And I'm just saying, if you meet anybody that is strong and faith and courageous and peace in their life, so forth, they've had to deal with some great pain in their life and some great sorrow in their life in order to be that way. It's just some of the tools God uses in life. All right, so let's bow our head.